Revelation chapter 21 verses 1 through 8 and the word of the Lord reads today from the King James text and I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea and I John saw the holy city New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying behold the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Now listen, saints. Verse 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Amen. I want to talk to us today for a while on the topic fear the final failure of the church would you bow your heads with me one more moment master once again god we come before you as the bread of life is broken open for the benefit of god's people how we need to hear a message from heaven how we need to receive a word from the throne room of grace if ever there's been an hour in the existence of the church that we have needed a prophetic word from god we need it today we need revival we need restoration we need to be reminded of our divine mission oh master anoint today your servant help me to deliver the word of God as you have delivered it to me that it might be of some blessing some benefit to the people of God speak to us by your spirit today let the anointing flow forth from this place and let the hearer know O God that this preacher is not interested in preaching man-made doctrine or dogma but, oh God, today I humble myself before you and offer myself unto you that I might be your oracle at this hour. Give us a word, for we need it, and we ask it all in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. There is no greater promise than all the word of God than the promise of God for a new heaven and a new earth. One day, saints, all that is wrong with this world will 
be in fact made right. One day all that has been corrupted and defiled by sin and unbelief will be restored to its original state. But rather than renovate that which has been polluted and defiled, our God has promised to destroy all that exists by fire and then recreate with his original blueprints all that once was. But until we realize this promise, we as believers must yet live in a sinful world full of negativity, demonic influence, and sin. How do we navigate our way through a world that is not at all today what it was meant to be from the beginning? We are not called to recreate or renovate our world. We are not called to recreate or renovate our nation. We have not been called to change what exists today and to make it into something that is pleasing to God. That is something we hear preached from any number of evangelical and fundamentalist pulpits, and it is a lie from the pit of hell. It has caused God's people to turn aside from their God-called task of evangelism and turn to political activism and social warfare. Until the Lord has allowed us to see the realization of His promise for a new heaven and a new earth, we have been called, listen to me folks, to endure the struggles that this world brings upon us and find a way to remain standing in the end with our faith yet intact. In Matthew chapter 10, maybe this is why I was saying Matthew at the start. In Matthew chapter 10, verses 16 through 26, the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking, and he says, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues, and ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, Take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Listen, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another for verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. 
It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. You know, there are preachers and there are churches and denominations that go out of their way Sunday after Sunday after Sunday to make sure that they identify to the world what the sins of man are and what offenses will put you in the devil's hell. And many preachers and many churches almost seem to preach this negative message of condemnation with glee. But interestingly enough, they seem to bypass what the Lord had to say in Revelation 21, our primary text today. Oh, you hear them preaching against the homosexual. You hear them preaching against the drunkard or the drug addict, the prostitute or the whoremonger. You hear them naming all these sins. You hear them condemning all these people. And yet you never hear a warning coming from the pulpits of churches today that uh, that inform the hearer that there is one great failure of the church that is going to take more people into the pit of hell than any sexual sin, any moral sin, any other named sin on the planet. I believe when God lists something in the word of the Lord that you can Look at the order of the items listed. And according to the pattern of Scripture, God always starts with those things which are the most serious or the most severe. And then he'll kind of trail on down the list. In Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8, the Lord has just given us the promise. He has just allowed John to see the new heaven and the new earth. Oh, hallelujah. What a vision that must have been for John. Hallelujah. Oh, what a wonderful thing it must be to be able to have seen the glories of what God has in store for his people while yet living in this human body. And the Lord said, He that overcometh, verse 7 of our primary text, He that overcometh shall inherit all things. He didn't say we're supposed to change the world and make it more godly. He didn't say we're supposed to make our nation more Christ-like and, and more in keeping with biblical rules and regulation. No, He said, He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God and he shall be my son. I'll remind you today, this is Jesus talking. Hallelujah. How do we know? Because he declared, right for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Hallelujah. And Jesus is the one who is recorded elsewhere in this same book as declaring himself Alpha 
and Omega, the beginning and the end. Hallelujah. And then here in Revelation 21, the Lord Jesus Christ is declaring, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is the thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God. Hallelujah. Oh, I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Isaiah 9 and 6, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. Hallelujah. I will be his God, and he shall be my son. My Lord, this isn't hard. But there's a there's a caveat. He then goes on in verse 8 and uses what I call the biggest, most consequential word in all the Bible. But every time you see that word oh boy something important is in the balance listen he said but the fearful and unbelieving the first two items on the list oh it's not the whoremonger it's not the prostitute. It's not homosexuals. It's not drunkards. It's not drug addicts. It's not wizards. No. The first two items on the list are the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I'm here to tell you today that the message that is preached in most churches in America today, especially those that identify as fundamentalist or evangelical, is a message of fear and a message of defeatism. And fear will put you in the lake of fire as fast as any sin you can name. But the fearful and unbelieving. Oh, preacher, you're preaching too hard. You know, you're supposed to be an affirming church. You're supposed to be a progressive church. We are, but we're also prophetic. And that means when God wants this preacher to say something to the church, universal, I must say it. The message being preached from most fundamentalist and evangelical churches today is a message of fear and unbelief. They are literally preaching the very things that the Lord said is going to put you in the lake of fire. And that is their message. Mega and Donald Trump would not exist today were it not for the church preaching a message of fear and unbelief. They are constantly preaching the people of God into a state of panic. They are constantly 
demonizing others. They are constantly engaging in hyperbolic speech in order to make the other side look as bad as the other side can possibly look. And they do this, my friend, for no other reason than to manipulate a certain voting block and that block consists of white evangelical Christians. And let me tell you something, it has worked marvelously. These people are so engulfed by a spirit of fear, they are so overcome by a spirit of unbelief, I saw a preacher on television at a Trump rally and this knucklehead had the gall to read from the word of God where the apostle Paul admonishes the church to submit themselves to governments and authorities because God alone sets up the government and authority and then he basically just iced over it because that doesn't apply when Mr. Biden is in the White House. Oh, but this is going to apply if and when Mr. Trump gets back in. No, my friend, that is not how it reads. When Paul wrote those words, the nation of Israel had been colonized by the Romans. They were occupied by the Romans. That was hardly an ideal government. That was hardly an ideal situation. And yet, even in that situation, Paul said to the church, submit yourselves to governors. Submit yourself to government. Submit yourselves to those that have authority. Hello now even in that situation. But we've got the church today cherry picking and pulling scripture apart, picking it apart, and just doing with it what they will to make it say what they want it to say. And they're preaching the people of God into a sheer and utter panic. Oh, if these other people get in, everything's going to be ruined. If these other people get in, everything's going to be horrible. It's going to be terrible. I'm 58 years old. I've been hearing that crap since I was a kid. And guess what? As many Democratic presidents as I've sat under, it still hadn't happened. People still have their guns. time everything's going to be terrible they're going to destroy everything oh we're going to be a communist nation where you dinglings don't even know what communism is you have no clue what com you have no idea in the universe what socialism is all these idiots running around saying that if the democrats get in we're going to be a socialist country um you, you couldn't even give me a dictionary definition of socialism if i asked you Folks, I'm here to tell you, ignorance, there's an old saying, ignorance is bliss. No, it is not. Ignorance is death and destruction. These people are as ignorant as a brick. They don't even know what socialism is. They don't even know what communism is. Got news for you. There is nothing in the democratic... model that suggests for one minute they have any interest in turning our country into a socialist or a communist country. It's not in the platform. It's not in their speech. It's not, no. You hear it because that's what you want to hear. Because some preacher has preached you into a state of panic and a state of fear. You're listening to lies and deceptions and hyperbole. And you're becoming fearful. You're becoming terrified. Because scared people are the easiest people to manipulate. But scared people, fearful people, unbelieving people, listen to me children, have no 
place in the church. Forget about those people that you think shouldn't be in God's church. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I've got news for you today. The fearful and unbelieving have no place in the church. And the final failure of God's church is not only in allowing fearful and unbelieving people to be in the church, but the final failure of the church is preaching a message of fear. Mm -hmm. Got news for you, children. Whatever happens in November, the same God who delivered Paul and Silas from a deep, dark dungeon, the same God who sent an earthquake to loose them from their bonds and set them free and open the doors, is the same God we serve today. And if we can claim that we believe in divine healing, if we can claim that we believe in a God of miracles, if we can claim that we believe that our God is today what he was yesterday and he'll be tomorrow what he is today, if we can make that claim, then why? in the name of God should we be fearful? Why in the name of God should we be panicked? Why in the name of God should we be in a state of anxiety? If God was able to lead Peter out of prison at the hand of a holy angel, I've got news for you. He can do it for you and I. Hallelujah. If he can loose the in the deepest, darkest dungeon for Paul and Silas. He can do the same for you and I. Amen. What makes people not realize that the same God who performed any number of miracles, who issued warnings, who spoke to his servants in the New Testament, so that miraculous things were done. Paul warned while being transported in a prisoner ship, he warned his captors, you better not leave out of port. If you leave out of port, this ship will be destroyed. Did they listen? No. Most of the time I can tell you that we preachers who preach a prophetic message are ignored 99% of the time. It's one of the frustrations of having this type of ministry. Did they listen to Paul? No. They set sail. The storm came. Oh, but that same Paul who heard from God before they left port was able to hear from God while the storm was raging. Hallelujah. And he said, folks, I got another word for you. There stood by me tonight. Hallelujah. Oh, glory. An angel of the Lord. And he told me, Paul, listen, fear not. It doesn't matter how bad the situation is. It doesn't matter how horrific your circumstance may be. Fear not. Hallelujah. No life will be lost. Said, oh, God's given you every soul on this boat. Oh, glory to God. Not only is everybody going to live, but God's going to send a revival amongst a bunch of imprisoned men. Glory to God. And then as they 
wind up shipwrecked and they're holding on to pieces of the boat so they might stay afloat atop the water. Every man on that boat was able to walk upon the shore of an island. Every person, as Paul said, survived that shipwreck. And as they gathered wood to make a fire, an asp attached itself to Paul's hand, a deadly venomous snake, a snake that would render a man dead in a matter of hours. And the word of God said, Paul, shoot that old snake off into the fire. And then proceeded to continue doing what he was doing. And all of his Roman captors and all of his fellow prisoners watched him. <laughs> I'm just waiting for him to fall. I'm just waiting for him to fall dead because you don't get bit by one of those snakes and live very long. And they watched him, the word of God said, and they watched him, and they watched him, and they watched him, and he showed no signs of trouble. He showed no signs of wear. He showed no signs of, uh, of uh, the venom coursing through his veins. And it was that miracle that turned these men's eyes to the Jesus that Paul preached. If God could do all of that in the first century, and if Jesus Christ, according to the word of God, is the same yesterday, today, and forever, then why in the name of God should any church be preaching and promoting fear and unbelief? I got news for you folks. I'm going to tell you a little secret you may not realize. The message of the Southern Baptist movement has been a message of fear from day one. They have always preached a message of fear. They have always used fear to manipulate and control their members. So if God is able to do as God has done in times past, then God will be able to do today what he has done in the past. God's people have nothing to fear. The Southern Baptist message for centuries has been a message of fear. They constantly preach a message of fear. You need to be afraid of this. You need to be afraid of that. It's like an abusive narcissistic, narcissistic husband who tries to make his wife fearful of all others. Because if you're afraid of everybody else, then you become dependent solely upon them. Our message is not that we are to overcome this world and make our nation and make our world into something that we believe is more pleasant and pleasing to God. But our message is to endure and to overcome the trials and the temptations that we face in this life coming out on the other end with our faith firmly intact. In James chapter 1 and 12, the word of the Lord declares, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 13, the word of God declares, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. 
For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, listen, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. The false message of American exceptionalism and mega appeals to the carnal minded and the spiritually ignorant. It is a message which says that we are to be the rulers and the authorities. We are called to be in control and to make things as they ought to be. This message is a lie from hell which Satan has deployed in an effort to set God's people up for ultimate failure. Do you think the Word of God tells us of suffering and persecution as some sort of joke? Do you think God's Word is full of lies and untruths? Obviously you do. Those who try to pervert the message of Christianity embrace the message which soothes their fears and calms their anxieties. But faith is the answer to these struggles, not political power or secular influence. And the fear that causes these anxieties to grow and prosper in our thinking is contrary to faith. That fear is contrary to God. That fear is contrary to the victory we have promised to us in the end. The message and goal of the believer is not to conquer or control, but rather to endure and come out the other side victorious. 2 Timothy 2, 10 through 12. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sakes that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead in him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1 verses 6 and 7 Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Listen. Verse 7 For God hath not given us the spirit of fear but of power and of love, and of a sound mind. Telling you the answer to anxieties is not political power, it is not social influence, it is faith, hallelujah. Oh, it is getting into the house of God and stirring up the gift that is within you. Glory to God. Let the Holy Ghost flow. Let the Holy Ghost move. I'm going to tell you, I don't care what kind of hell goes on in the world. As long as I got a good Holy Ghost filled church I can be part of, all will be well in the end. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, the Apostle Paul makes a clear declaration. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently 
seek him. How is it so many Christians in the world today are in churches that preach a fear-based message and they somehow think that in embracing this message they are pleasing God? No. But the fearful and unbelieving are going to have their part in the lake of fire my friend that is what the word of God says for without faith it is impossible not improbable impossible to please him in 1 Peter 5 6 through 9 Peter the apostle writes humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Paul said our adversary, like a roaring lion, seeketh whom he may devour. You see, when a lion hunts, a lion doesn't just pick an animal out of the pack and then go after that animal. No, no, that's not how they hunt. They look for the weak. They look for the young. They look for the naive, the one who is not careful to stay close to the rest of the pack or the rest of the herd. He looks for the one that is the most vulnerable. But one of the things that's interesting about Paul's Analogy, he said, Satan, like a roaring lion. <laughs> Lions don't roar when they hunt. Lions roar when they're trying to scare off somebody. Lions roar when they're competing with one another, but they don't roar when they hunt. You ever seen a lion hunt? When a lion hunts, it keeps its mouth shut. It's very stealth. It's very quiet. It looks for that one that is uh, weak. They look for that one that is the most susceptible to attack. But Paul said, like a roaring lion, What does that tell us? I'll tell you what it tells us. It tells us that Satan is trying to inspire fear. You see, he wants God's people to walk about constantly in fear of him. We have people today who have been convinced that if their party and their candidate doesn't win, in November that the devil is one all the devils are. Um, that doesn't sound like a faith message to me oh my lord have mercy every time all oh, the eight years Obama was in all I ever heard was negativity out of the mouths of evangelicals and fundamentalists I never heard faith but I heard all kinds of fear I heard all kinds of unbelief but the fearful and the unbelieving. Romans chapter 8 verses 31 through 39 almost done today. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? 
It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more, listen, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Sounds like a faith message to me. That doesn't sound like we need to be afraid of much. Paul said, what's going to separate us from the love of Christ? War? Famine? Persecution? These are all the things that the churches are telling us we ought to be afraid of. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Paul said, hey, none of these things going to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Then he goes on to say, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. As believers, we must be prepared to endure. We run in a race that is not at all a sprint. This journey is not an easy journey. But the rewards are beyond our wildest imaginations. The Lord performed miracles on behalf of the early church, delivering Peter from prison and breaking Paul and Silas free from the shekels which were wrapped around their hands and feet. Why in the world would we not believe that the same God who did such wondrous works on behalf of the early church would not also do similarly for us should we be in a situation requiring such intervention. Rather than falling victim to the fear-mongering of the preachers and pundits of our day, we are called to hold fast to our faith and believe God. Because he that endureth to the end shall be saved. And lastly, in closing this afternoon, in Revelation 3 and verse 11, the Lord Jesus Christ spoke these words. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Hallelujah. Oh, children, do not let the final failure of the church be your fate. Do not let a message of fear and anxiety be a message that you have come to embrace. Understand that God does not receive the fearful and the unbelieving. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. God is looking for a people who can believe Him. God is looking for a people who can trust Him. God is looking for a people who can take Him at His word. God is looking for a people who understand that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Oh, hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I, I don't want any part of the message of fear. I want to preach, and I want to live the message of faith. Amen. That message will help me 
to endure. It may not make me a king. It will not put me in control. It will not allow me to make the world into what I think the world ought to, ought to be. But it will make me more than a conqueror. So that in the end I will see the same new heaven and the same new earth that John wrote about in Revelation chapter 21. Hallelujah. Amen. amen. Praise God and amen. Praise.